Can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, everything works. Okay, uh -huh. so uh, we could wait for a couple more minutes. Sure. Uh, and then... Okay, uh, I think we're ready to start. Uh, Misha, could you introduce a speaker? Yeah, sure. So, hey everyone, today we have Matteo Bartengi from University uh, of Stuttgart's uh, Software Lab, who will talk to us about human attention on source code and neural attention on source code. And uh, Matteo, please tell me, are you okay with having questions during the talk? We would like them in the end of the talk. It's fine. Uh, during the talk, it's fine, uh, as you, you prefer. All right. Thank you. So uh, if you, you know, folks, if you have a question, please raise your hand right in the chat, and we'll find the, the time to ask Matteo. And thank you. Matteo, you have the floor. Okay. Thanks uh, for the introduction. So thanks again for the invitation. So can you also see my, my mouse? Uh, yep. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so let's start. So today I will talk to you about uh, our work on, um, as uh, you introduced already, um, exploring the human and neural attention one against the other. And uh, we'll talk about uh, work we've done, so with some insights. And then uh, towards the end, I will introduce some applications. So let's uh, start with, um, so this is a, a brief agenda as I just uh, told you. Uh, let's start with some motivation. Why do we care about the attention of, of the models? So for example, here we have, uh, we can imagine this is a snippet of code that we have in our IDE. And at some point, uh, our uh, AI tool like uh, Copilot uh, gives us a prediction and um, auto-completes our code and gives us this next line. Uh, so maybe the next line looks good to us, um, maybe not. But uh, in any way, we didn't get any information about how uh, that line uh, got produced. So we have these models and we use them mostly uh, black box. So it's unclear what was considered. So let me uh, get into a motivation with a more uh, challenging example. 
So in this case, still in the auto completion uh, setup. So we have our uh, IDE with uh, two tabs, um, with two classes defined to different files that do sorting in different ways. One, let's say in the normal way direct and the other one sorts reverse. And um, at certain point we create a new file and uh, we are about to generate, um, so I don't know why I have, okay. The bar of zoom was in between, okay. So at certain point uh, we we are writing a test for our visit and we have both uh, imported in our IDE uh, in our file and uh, we expected the um, expected array to give us a fixed value and the question is whether it will be the input array uh, sorted or the reversed one so it could be either uh, this one or uh, the other one but we, we don't know what uh, what to expect and also probably the model is is confused in in this case so if we make it more easy, uh, easier for the model, we know that uh, if we only have this other tab open, probably they will just give us the, the dark one. Uh, I've tried with a quick, uh, uh, quickly myself and it, it works like that. And uh, the same uh, if we just give the reverse. But in this case, when there, there are both, we, we don't know. And we would like to know um, if we have many tabs at certain points on intricate relationship in our code bases and we get some prediction, we, we might wonder, okay, but why? Why that uh, might be surprising for us. And uh, we, we could understand how to better direct uh, the model to generate some code for us. I mean, maybe it's not just an array, which we can code it ourselves easily, but maybe it's something more complex and we would want our AI tools to generate it automatically. And But we need to give the right context. So beside the row prediction nowadays, we um, we have no clue of why, for example, Copilot um, made certain prediction. So we know what was predicted, but not not why at, at the current stage, and so on for all the other uh, kind of tools like that. So this is one of the motivation why for us it's important to study uh, these um, models. So the risks here are that we have a model that is apparently right, but it's looking at the right wrong part of the code for example so for the wrong reason and we we don't want we don't want that and also if we want to kind of debug and try to improve it uh, it's more difficult because, because we don't really know how those that prediction was produced and why exactly that not something else so these are some some risks and our goal uh, is uh, to counter uh, counteract them at least with uh, some insight so try to understand um gather insight uh, on the weaknesses of our model and also to to inform better uh, better model design in the future. Uh, yeah, do you, you have any question uh, for the microphone? Okay, feel free to interrupt me. Um, and uh, so our the goal of our work is to uh, compare what uh, could be a, a reason, so the why of a of a model on the right, and uh, what is the the rationale that uh, of a human. So. And the own tasks of, of code, uh, obviously, which is uh, which is our focus. So uh, across the um, uh, the talk, I will uh, use this uh, um, uh, template uh, frequently. So we conceptually have the, this framework where we have some source code and some specific task instructions, and we feed both uh, to the AI. Uh, so it could be Copilot or other specialized tool for some other tasks and to the human or the developers. And then we we gather some prediction, which could be either a code or natural language. And uh, what we do, as I said before, we compare the attention while doing this specific task. And we do the following for, for three tasks. So for code summarization, for, for bug fixes, and for sense making questions, which I will introduce uh, one by one uh, next. So the attention, uh, for, for um, having a proxy of how these uh, two entities like AI and human uh, reason, we, we rely on the attention maps, which um, look like the following. So they are uh, token or character level attention maps. So they are heat maps uh, for which each uh, entity, in this case, a token receives a weight uh, and the weight determines the color. So the, the highest the weight, the more attention was given to this part of the, of the code. And we uh, we have them both from the model and from the developer. And we collect this data obviously in two different ways. So on one side, we have uh, relied on the attention uh, layers, which are one of the fundamental innovation in the neural networks uh, like 
transformers and all the large language models rely on them. So we thought it was a good idea because they are widespread and they're also behind the success of these large language models. So they might have something interesting. And um, on the other side, uh, we have um, designed uh, a specific uh, uh, UI, web UI, which we'll introduce later, where you could um, record the attention of the, of the developer. So which part of the code was looked at and also we worked on uh, eye tracking uh, as well. So it will be a mix of these two uh, tooling and that I will introduce uh, both of them. So um, if it's uh, if you have any question, feel free, free to ask them, um, otherwise I can continue. So this is the first task and we have a uh, code summarization. The, the conceptual idea is that we have a whole story, which could be a part of our code, a larger code, and we want to brief somewhere. And uh, in particular, I'm focused on this task because it was uh, widely popular when we did this study uh, two years ago, and it's, it still is of interest uh, for the research uh, community. And also because it, we argue it requires a deeper understanding of what the code uh, is, uh, is doing to, to give a proper name. So how it looks like? We have the method body. Uh, this is uh, our Java code in this case. And um, we feed it to, to, to both of the entities, so the AI and the, and the human. And we ask, uh, let, let's name it. Um, so these, uh, these AI models are two models which have been specifically trained for code summarization, both of them. Uh, so we study one transformer-based model and one uh, convolutional neural network-based model. And they both have attention layers so that we can get uh, their attention. Then we we ask them, uh, okay, so let's name it. So they give us a method name. So in this case, a sort. And um, uh, so so this is this is the task. Uh, what we use to record uh, the human attention, um, we use this uh, this uh, web UI. It's called Human Reasoning Recorder. And uh, the task that we designed for the um, so for the let's go back for the. For the model, they are trained on this task. So once they get this as input, they naturally spit out uh, something, which would be the, the tokens of the model, the, the method name. Whereas for the human, we had to design a, a task, which was uh, comparatively similar and um, on which we could gather data. So we, we didn't want to give free text to the user. Otherwise it would be difficult to measure the performance, uh, but we wanted to give a more confined task. So what we gave, uh, we gave a task where the human has to see the code here in this uh, in this area where all the the code is uh, is blurred and uh, by moving with the mouse you can uh, you can unblur only certain token and the one in the vicinity of in the neighborhood of the specific cursor and they can explore the code and then they have to pick one of the seven alternatives that are listed here and you can't see them unless you move the, your mouse on top of them so you can imagine they are here listed seven seven names so in this case, it was entirely web-based, so we didn't have any complex eye tracking setup, and we could uh, uh, deploy it remotely. So our assumption here is that um, when we gather all the data of the movement of the user on this area, we can then compute for each token how much time was spent by the developer looking at the token. And we use this assumption for which the, the, more uh, the more time you spend on specific token, the more important it is. So the more attention uh, it receives. Um, so this was our way to compute those attention maps for, for the human that I introduced you before. I have a question here. Yes. yes. So, okay, one immediate uh, way to need peak I can see here is that people could have oh, more attention yeah. no, not for the most important tokens, but for the ones which are hardest to read. For example, if you look at Java, if the, where we have camel case, let's say we have like very long method name of six uh, subwords or stuff like that. So, you know, people could uh, could get stuck at that, figuring out what exactly is take from this put to that API method, uh, blah, blah. But no, even though they didn't really take that into account. Did you have any way to account for that? Yeah, that's that's an interesting comment. And um, in particular, uh, regarding this long uh, camel case uh, methods, so what we did, we, we split based on camel case. So our tokenization was um, splitting the tokens based on, on camel case. So if there is a long word with camel case, they are like different tokens. 
So they, they use her while moving in, a, in one uh, part of uh, that's a long uh, name. They will only uh, see the tokens next to it. So we, we, we mitigate that by just accounting for the different sub tokens of that um, long word. So let's let's say if we have something, let's see if we have something here. Like here, synchronous destination, they are two different tokens and um, they get different uh, um, uh, attention, let's say. Uh, so if it's, if it's a long and complex name, we will just give attention to some uh, complex token in between and not to the entire, the entire long word. So there could be also bias towards long uh, tokens against a uh, short one. So this is how we try to, to counterbalance that. Does it answer or you have some other comments? Uh, yeah, I think the chat was, yeah, thanks. That looks uh, interesting. If I okay. may, I also have a question um, about the reason, maybe you can elaborate a bit more, why you suggested several answers to people instead of just uh, giving, them a, giving them opportunity to come up with any any summarizing name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we wanted the task to be not too um, complex and uh, uh... Also, that, that's one of the requirements. And the, the other one that I already mentioned uh, was that we uh, wanted to... Uh, evaluate it. Okay, so, so we wanted an evaluation metric. And uh, if we get like a um, general um, natural language would have been more uh, more complex to, to score that. Uh, so we, we thought it would be um, easier to score uh, some other... Uh, um in in another way um like if they pick the right one that's that's more clear that uh, they are right whereas if they generate something very similar it could be uh debatable whether it's correct or not and we mm. need it we need it so uh, you could say okay also for the model the model is generating natural language why not to to score uh similarly to how the model is is scored um the thing is that since this was an environment which was online uh, so it was more practical. This third reason um, is that we use the uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but yeah, it's yeah. a tool from Amazon that you can hire uh, people to to uh, do some tasks. And uh, we wanted to have a quick way and precise way to reject some tasks, uh, some some people. Uh, so basically, yeah. there are people who just click and they just do a task, but they clearly don't don't know what they're doing. They just want the reward behind this this task. And so with this metric, we could just say, okay, if you don't uh, go above this certain threshold, then we we drop this uh, uh, this uh, this user, and I think this was the most important one, and it's also part of uh, it's written in the paper more in details. There is a specific formula we use to compute that, and okay. uh, we somehow uh, hope to have guaranteed some certain level of quality in, in the data set. Okay. Of course, if you, if you have access to real developers and you know they're doing what what they're supposed to do, maybe colleagues or, or so on. I agree. It's it's better to ask them to to write uh, to write it down natural language, so the metrics between model and human are more uh, similar. And uh, okay, yeah. I understood. And also, I wonder if the uh, options were similar to those generated previously by the model, or you just picked somehow the answers from your like maybe rule of thumb or something. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So um, what we do, we include for sure the correct uh, naming, um, and then we pick uh, by um, K-nearest neighbor uh, mm -hmm. with the TF-IDF tree, uh, close, um, close enough uh, possible names. So maybe they have they share some tokens and we put them in the answer. And uh, also uh, three randomly picked uh, name across the, the entire data set. So in this oh. way, we get a correct, a pseudo-correct answer, which is somehow similar and then uh, three random. And that's also taken into account into our filtering. So we reward uh, like users that pick some somehow correct answer instead of uh, um, yeah completely random, for example. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Thanks again for the question. Okay, so and now that we gather this, um, this data from the, um, the, the model and uh, the human, we we compare uh, all of the data that we get from the model um pair uh, pairing wise with the, the human one and uh, we use the the spearman rank correlation coefficient to to compare the two 
And for the model, we have two types of um, attentions that we can uh, gather. And uh, the copy attention is, uh, let me see if it's in the next slide, no, it's here. So the, the copy attention is um, uh, focusing on some uh, tokens in particular that could be copied directly from input, then in this case, the method name to the output, so, sorry, the method body to the output, which is the method name. So in this case, destination was a good candidate to be copied into the, the, the prediction. And this is something specific for this uh, task of code summarization. And it's uh, it's great to deal with uh, limited uh, vocabulary size, because in this case, if you deploy a model that uh, doesn't know a certain token, but they are there in your code, it can copy them. Uh, so th this model was still uh, reasoning on uh, token, uh, uh, token wise. Um, so yeah, that's that's it. So this is how we measure uh, the agreement between uh, model on one side and human on the other side. So this is a summary of our attention data set. So we have 1,500 uh, human attention maps. We work on 10 Java projects and we involved uh, 91 participants with uh, both students and people from Amazon Mechanical Turk, as I, as I said, for which we employ this, this filtering. And this is somehow an example of attention map from, from the uh, human. So as I introduced you before, there are two types of, of attention. So maybe we can, uh, we can skip this slide. Um, yeah, as I said, the attention takes uh, copies something from the input directly uh, to the output. So let's now dive into the uh, results. So by now comparing each pair of human versus machine. So we have uh, the following diagrams, um, distributions of the um, computed um, agreement for um, in, and the Spearman rank correlation coefficient for, for them. So for example, here we have the human versus the uh, convolutional neural network model with the, the regular attention. Then we have copy attention. And then here we have the human versus human. So these are uh, the result, the results. So uh, here we have the counting of the number of pairs uh, that have been uh, that have shown this certain range of um, Spearman uh, correlation coefficient. So what we can observe here, uh, so we have the, the the orange one are the uh, copy attention and the, the blue one are the regular attention. So we have that. There is a poor agreement shown with, with the regular attention, at least for, for these models, which were uh, some some bit a bit old, let's say. Um, then we have um, some copy uh, attention instead that have uh, that shows high high agreement, uh, like uh, moderate to to high, and uh, it's also good to see that uh, developers agree with the, with each other. So it's good that there is an overall consensus on where to look at for, for naming these methods. So by mentioning, by finding out that copy attention agrees with humans, we sort of justify the, the use of this copy attention as something uh, which is actually useful both for the task, but also agrees with, with how human uh, reason on, on code. So it's an empirical justification. Uh, uh, just uh, could you give a little bit more details on us on how you compute the correlation? So basically, uh, let's say we have uh, I don't know. Uh, let's say we have a piece of code. So what the, what happens next? Then you evaluate the amount of time uh, human spends on each uh, token, and you compare that to amount of attention the model gives to each token. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Okay, I just wonder. Uh, it could also be interesting to figure out what what goes on with a candle tau or correlation metric uh, because basically it checks for whether the order, very mostly speaking, checks whether the order is the same. So it could also be uh, funny to check. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great thing, and we also uh, evaluated that. It's mentioned also in the paper. So we we worked with both. So Spearman mm -hmm. rank is also for uh, ordered uh, data. So uh, as as Kendall Tau, uh, so we we reported the 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 Spearman rank, but in a I believe in our data set uh, in our artifact, we also have results with Kendall Tau, which show the same the same story. So, but yeah, we 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 experimented with with that, and more recently with another uh, with a divergence, a Shannon divergence, I think, um, 
I think, but it it was showing the same uh, same uh, kind of trend also in the, in the other study where where we use that. So they they all tell the same story. We picked the Spearman rank because it's uh, somehow uh, more uh, more established, and uh, also it has a p value, unlike divergence, for example, which is just a measure of distance. So yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks so much. All right. And uh, any comments you might have on human versus human uh, agreement, uh, like Spearman uh, rank zero point five or zero point six, uh, like being average looks. I mean, not to not not to say any bad words about your your work, but it doesn't look to be too high. Is it because of using mechanical chalk or could it be some other reasons that you find the uh, human human agreement is far from perfect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, that's a good question. But um, I think we, we can confirm that later. My my feeling is that also the other uh, work that I'm gonna present, so the other studies, they they have a similar range of agreement between humans. So and in the others, we we didn't have Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, but just direct contact or even employees uh, of a company. So I think uh, it's uh, it may be an inherent uh, distance between how two different people reason about the same piece of code. Um, so, but but we don't have any any insight uh, an insight of that uh, on that. Uh, okay. So loosely speaking, basically zero point six is probably as good as we can get because human are too different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you a lot for the question. Okay, so the second research question is about the um, we want to quantify how much attention certain token get with respect to the uniform uh, attention scenario. Um, so if someone would look uniformly at, at each token, what we would have, and we want to quantify how distant we are from that scenario. So um, we have different types of tokens. So we analyze this. Um, distance from a, a uniformity for, for each token. So we might have strings, we might have separators, and also identifiers. So what we do, we, as I said, separate by token category, and we compute this uh, um, uh, distance from uniformity, which is a matrix, which is uh, described uh, in the paper, which does exactly that, checks how much uh, we are distant from the uh, uniformity. So we have when it is zero, it means that um, we give attention to token exactly how we would give if they are uniformly, um, our attention is uniformly distributed. If it's more than zero, we give more than uniform attention. And if it's, uh, if it's less than zero, we give less than uniform attention. So we somehow kind of overlook them. Um, and these, these are the results for the five different groups. So the humans are uh, the green one, and uh, the others are the, are the model. So the first uh, that you see here in orange, you have the copy attention, then you have the regular attention, and you also have the uh, human attention in green. So what you can see here is that this token um, categories, keywords, operators, and strings, they are very much uh, deemed important by the human, but they are somehow overlooked by the model in all the different types of attention, which this disregard them give less than even uniform attention uh, sometimes so this could be a uh, venue for improvement for future uh, models that maybe you should pay more attention to for example something like string or other uh, keywords and operators which are deemed important by the human then um, yeah please question here so it looks like almost every month in, in many cases uh, uh attention uh, 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 computer attention is more like uh, distant, uh, uh, distant than the human one in the sense that the figures are more, uh, the numbers are more uh, like f um, more far from zero. For example, for I don't know identifier, we have is a uh, in my, is a plus one or sort of minus one, and I don't know for keywords the absolute value of attention from different models is often. In, is in most of the cases higher than the human one. You think this is like a quirk which is related to the fact that human, uh, from technical point of view, look at, at more than one token at the same time? Or is it because uh, basically models de de definitely pay more attention to, uh, to one token and, and the, than the other and 
this is a Thompson two metadata. Sorry, I didn't get the, the, the premise. So, so what's the, the premise of your... Okay, so, all right. Uh, let's look at the absolute value of attention as you just as you do define here. The, mm -hmm. abs the absolute value for, for the models looks to be higher than for the human. And uh, I wonder why is, it, why is it so? Do you have any ideas? So, so what looks higher, the value of the attention here, like in the in the identifier? Yeah, the absolute value for identify, separate, stuff like that. I mean, like a regular transformer got uh, attention for identifier circa minus 0, minus 0 0.7. So the absolute value of the attention is like 0 0.7. So it's like a regular transformer overlooks identifiers way more than human overlook anything. And same goes for not for taking for taking into consideration something like I don't know copy attention uh, pays way too more attention to the identifiers than humans. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so, so for this uh, first, uh, let me try to explain. Um, try to answer. So, for the first one, I, for example, for identifiers, we have an explanation for that because copy attention is supposed to copy some tokens, which will then be used in the method name. And the those that go in the method names rightfully, we would say, focuses on those and why we have such a high value in, in absolute terms. For for the others, uh, yeah, we we don't have a good uh, good explanation. Perhaps here yeah, for, for, for regularization, they might uh, consider more separators because we know that these models don't get any knowledge about the, the syntax. So somehow they have to infer the syntax and maybe they use separators for that. But uh, for the other categories, uh, yeah, I, I, if you are if you want comments on the absolute values, uh, does yeah. that answer your your question? Yeah, I have one hypothesis okay. Okay, great. which might be right or wrong. That is basically humans cannot, from a technical point of view, it is hard for a human to look at one token at a at a time. In the sense that if I unblur something. It's quite probable I am blur, I don't know, both separator and identifier, or I don't know, both uh, operator and then some keyword. But I might be wrong. Does it sound reasonable for you, or your experiment setup was different? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that's a, that's a, that's a one of the possible reasons. I, I get this point. It makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah, whereas the model is, is able to actually just pinpoint a specific token in the middle of uh, nowhere, let's say without uh, giving attention to anything around it, right? That's that's your point. Yeah, yeah, that could be, that also could be a test. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, and um, the third uh, research question was whether um, we have um, difficult to name method. So we wanted to analyze effectiveness on different types uh, of methods, so different families that we um, grouped by and also for increasing length so whether longer names longer methods are more difficult to name so here for the different uh, families so we consider getter setter and uh, more complex like checker like is uh, something like uh, predicates that start with uh, with check something let's say some flags and also test methods and then we have uh, rest so what we can see here across all the three uh, families so cnn uh, transformer and humans is that as we would expect, some methods are easier to name, like gather and setter, whereas others are more challenging. So like checker, tests, and others. And so they, they struggle. So the models struggle on, on this. So what we uh, would suggest here could be to, to insert more of these in the uh, in the training data set because they are more challenging. So probably the model can, can learn more from, from those examples. On the same um, reason, in the line, we, we check um, which was the average length of the method that the human named correctly and those that they were named wrong. And here we also check for the different ranges of F1 score, which is the metric we use to score the model, uh, whether the in the in for methods that they got high uh, score, uh, they were shorter or longer than methods which were scored very poorly. And uh, what we get, is um, 
probably what we would have expected. So that correct answers from the human usually are associated with shorter method than um, wrong answers. So probably, uh, and the same holds for the same trend holds for the, for the model. So once again, longer methods are harder to summarize for both of them, human and, and model. So here, we, as I said already, we, we argue it could be useful for, have, uh, for having better models to include more difficult, a larger portion of difficult examples, so either longer or more uh, complex one. So here, um, we want to check now that we have information about the um, efficiency, uh, let's say effectiveness of the model with F1 score and uh, about the agreement that we computed before. We want to check for, for each of these uh, comparison, whether we have uh, a correlation or somehow an association at least between, uh, between the two. So we have the, the four comparison. Um, here uh, we plot the agreement and here we plot the F1 score on that specific uh, model and that specific uh, method to name by, by the model. Um, so these are the results. So what we see is that there is, um, by computing the Pearson uh, correlation coefficient among these two uh, uh, variables, we obtain a um, weak but positive um, correlation between, uh, between the two, uh, which could uh, mean that more effective um, prediction and higher agreement, a human model, they they coincide somehow. So this could point towards uh, the fact that we could have uh, to, to improve our current model, we might want to closely mimic how humans look look at the code. For example, it could be using human attention traces so our data sets, for example, or others as, as training data, as further training data. And there has been some, some uh, similar work in, uh, in NLP, which has shown promising results, like including uh, human attention boosted performance there in natural language. So could be similar in here for code. So now let's move to the second task. So the first one was about code summarization. The second one is about bug fixing. So again, uh, the motivation behind that was that automatic program repair, which are the technique that try to fix bugs automatically are uh, getting more and more popular. And uh, here, find I mean, fixing a bug could be seen as something even more challenging than giving it a name. So what we give as input, we give the uh, buggy method plus the buggy line info. So this model, typically, they get information about the buggy line uh, in some, some sort of way. It's encoded. Whereas for the human, we just highlighted it in the ID. So even they knew which one was the buggy line. Then we ask the model, uh, let's fix it. So this model, they just get it. Uh, uh, directly and they try to propose a uh, patch. So their prediction in this case is a patch. Uh, so it's uh, it's another line because we focus on single line uh, code, uh, on single line bugs, uh, which which fixes uh, that bug. So it's a patch that fixes the bug. And the same for uh, for, for human. So they're asked, so in this case, they're not just, they, um, they beside being able to see the code, they can also edit the, the specific line. Uh, so it's it's a bit more advanced uh, ID, but the concept is the same. They can just, besides having everything blurred, they can change something. These are the results. So we see the accuracy. So in the first um, research question, we want to assess the accuracy of the two, AI models and humans. So on the left table, we see the, let's say, absolute accuracy. So we have a data set with the 16 bugs coming from uh, the quick Quicks bugs data set. These bugs are uh, in Java. And uh, we give them to these two models. Uh, one is called sequencer, which is a sequence to sequence model. And one is recorder, which is a more uh, slightly more complex model, which uh, uses some tree, tree attention. And uh, the accuracy across the entire group. Yeah. Do you have a question? OK. So the um, accuracy across the entire group of developers. So we saw that at least one uh, person was able to fix um, each of them of these bugs. So each person got four bugs to fix. Um, and we, we got at least four uh, humans fixing a specific bugs, bug. So 
Uh, whereas for the for the other models, uh, we don't have the same performance. So they are around thirty percent of uh, accuracy, absolute, and we allow them also to generate more more patches, and uh, bo both of them generate the same uh, number of patches. So they generate top uh, uh, top hundred uh, patches. So this is uh, on the other side, since they are able to generate more patches and also human, they are more and they generate also more proposed solution for a specific uh, bug fix. We check um, how many um, of those proposed solution for the two groups like AI versus developers, how many of those are correct. So um, as I said before, uh, I said four developers per bug, but there are indeed uh, five to seven developers that saw each bug. And what we can what we can see here is that um, if we consider the top five predictions of the models, they have 2.5% uh, accuracy, both of them. And if we consider even more, uh, the accuracy is even lower because probably most of their generated code is uh, wrong, but some of them are, are right. And whereas the model is more, uh, let's say precise it generates obviously less uh, patches because it's slower usually than a model, but they are more uh, correct uh, on average. So this is the plausible um, patch ratio, which is a patch that passes the test case that we had, whereas correct patch ratio is even more uh, stricter. It's stricter, and uh, we check whether it's uh, it's exactly uh, correct. So we manually inspect them these specific uh, remaining ones. So it's, it's slightly uh, less. Um, so what we see here is that the summary is that developers are clearly more effective than the studied uh, uh, automatic program repair. And um, so probably uh, more work is needed to reach this developer level effectiveness on this task. But a small disclaimer is that recent work using ChatGPT it seems that they are achieving on par human effectiveness, at least on this small data set, which uh, could be because of uh, data set the pollution. So we don't know, but uh, at least it seems that the LLMs, pre-trained LLMs are um, getting much better than what was benchmarked here one, one year and a half ago. Um, so yeah, that's about the accuracy of the bug fixing. And now we go again towards the agreements. So this is the same uh, plot. Uh, we did it before, but with this on this new task, we have the same um, Spearman rank, which goes minus one, absolute uh, opposite of each other, and plus one, which is max. And uh, as I said before, uh, zero point five is uh, is our average among humans, uh, five six, um, which uh, is in line with the previous uh, work. Although the other one had Amazon Mechanical Turk, these were only direct contacts. So probably there is a variability inside inside humans. And um, then we also have only one model that has copy attention. So this uh, the register coder, which is one of the APR model and that we have a sequencer. And uh, we don't see in this case any difference between the two, uh, strangely enough, uh, to attention. So you see that uh, um, re regular attention and copy attention, they exhibit a similar pattern. And in this case also, we check whether the two models agree with each other. And here we have uh, much less, uh, a bit less uh, agreement. Um, so just for curiosity, we did that. So as, as I said, uh, human developer mostly agree with each other. So this is our, is in line with, with previous uh, results. Um, then we also have that they have uh, human and models, they have a moderate positive um, agreement when doing the, uh, uh, bug fixing as well and it seems although um, i'm not sure how significant is the difference but recorder which fixes uh, one more bug so the fixing accuracy was higher uh, also had a higher um, agreement with the human so it kind of doesn't disprove let's say the the other uh, previous uh, claim that maybe somehow a uh, higher human model agreement coincides with better performance but also, it's, I wouldn't say it is not strong enough definitely to, to back it up because we have such a smaller data set. And uh, also, there might be variabilities between the model themselves. So not really. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't make it like a definite uh, conclusion.
If I may, I may have a hypothesis why in this case copy attention does not work as well as for mm -hmm. the uh, code summarization. Mm -hmm. I'd be in my opinion that in the first case, there is more chance to copy the right token. For example, if you got a recurse call, recursive call, you can obviously copy the name of the function. If you, you if you have a getter and somewhere you write something dot get, it's reasonable that you need to have a get or stuff like that. While in bug fixing, it's not always obvious you need to copy a token exactly. Maybe you need to change a sign or whatever. So it might be that it's yeah. It's yeah. Hard to copy. Yeah, yeah, I like, I like your, your interpretation. It's definitely convinced me. So it, it makes a perfect sense. So in the example that I showed in the beginning, uh, there was an arithmetic operation which was wrong and you, you can't copy randomly from other part of the code. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, and um, since we are working on bugs fixing, we have two different concepts here. So we have the buggy line, and the context. So our study here wanted to understand for the different uh, snippets to repair, which are here vertically. So how much attention was given to the buggy line, for example, and you can take the complementary. So the rest was given by, by to the context. So we had the mean uh, among three. You can already see the, the kind of aggregated result here. And um, this is the story for the for all the snippets and here as vertical, you can see the averages that you can see also here. So interestingly, among uh, beside the variability that are specific, obviously to the specific snippet, but we can see that the human is somewhere in between. So it's trying to balance extreme behavior, like giving all the attention to the buggy line or giving all the attention to the context. So, and of course, we know from this study that human also fixed it, uh, fixed this snippet better. So maybe it's also one of the reasons why, uh, which are behind the key, uh, um, behind the success of human humans, let's say. So on the same line, we wanted to see uh, the time evolution of developers only in this case, because we had the data along all the session and uh, we had the percentage of attention uh, giving on uh, uh, tokens belonging to the buggy lines or tokens belonging to the context. So in the beginning, which is the left part, we have uh, very little, let's say, attention to the buggy line, which stays somehow constant until the end, which increases. And uh, maybe we would have ex expected this behavior as well, because at certain point, a human has to go to the buggy line and actually change it. So um, a lot of attention would be there. Uh, although we, we had some tricks in place for a data collection to counterbalance this phenomenon. So for example, after like three seconds, the uh, tokens were blurred again, if you didn't move the mouse. And uh, so you, you didn't have uh, like a bias uh, too much, let's say towards this effect. Uh, but uh, so we could say that it makes sense that at the beginning you give roughly one fourth, so 25% of your attention to the buggy line and you explore more the context. And then the more you advance during the task, the more you narrow down to the buggy line and you try to understand what is exactly wrong because you know exact, you know already that something is wrong in that line. So uh, in the end, you want to, to narrow it down. So as I said, from uh, this uh, research question, we, we deduce that probably future APR could try to um, balance better this tension between context and buggy line, similarly how uh, to how a human naturally do, and maybe also through time, I don't know, could be interesting to have some model that first uh, prefers the context and then narrows it down and focus on the buggy line and shrinks the context, for example, and focuses on just the buggy line. Okay, so now let's move to the last uh, task which was uh, done during an internship at, uh, at GitHub last, uh, last summer. So it, this task is called the uh, sense-making task and we have sense-making questions. So by uh, designing this task, we wanted to test some uh, recent capabilities of large language models, which are like zero shot abilities where you don't train the model on some task, but you just ask it to the model and the model is somehow able to do the task regardless of 
whether it has done something similar in the past or not, because it reuses knowledge, especially with chatbot that is uh, very much uh, clear. Um, so here we wanted to have different uh, topics that uh, are asked directly, let's say, to the model. And these topics can range from execution. So what is the output of, the, of this code or concept, like any function with side effect in the code base that you can see or about concurrency and deadlock. So this is the, the input that we gave to clearly both the human and, uh, and the model. And um, we have a program in the beginning, which is like one of uh, the five uh, possible programs that we, we sourced from uh, some um, lead code task, let's say, but even, even simpler. Um, and uh, then at the end, we have embedded through a comment, a question for the model, like what could happen if the call order were omitted from classified triangle, uh, which is uh, this uh, function defined in here uh, somewhere in between. So we wanted to test some generic abilities of the model to reason on code. So that's why we call them sense making. So as I said, we have the prompt and we use this template question and then uh, answer. And we, we ask the model continue from here. And same for, for human. We ask uh, the human to, to give us an answer. So um, once we have the answer, which is a natural language, um, yeah, then we also gather the attention. So here we have the example of questions. We can dive into more details if you have questions later. But the interesting thing is that we designed these questions and we worked on different languages, Python, C++, and C Sharp. And they are also relatively uh, different uh, um, length of snippet. So they, they range from uh, 30 to uh, even 100 lines. So this is nice because, um, and this was also challenging because in this work, we didn't use this um, uh, HRR, human reasoning recorder. So this web UI, but we actually use eye tracking. So it's usually challenging task for eye tracking to uh, allow the scrolling. So we had to, to work on that and um, uh, it, was, it was fun. So I will give you some insight in the, in the next slide. So here, uh, the said the study overview um, is similar to the conceptual framework we saw in the beginning. So we gave this task to 22 developers, we, um, and, uh, which were equipped with the uh, night tracking. So we controlled the setup with people that were part of the company. They were from, uh, from Microsoft. Um, and we gathered their attention and their answers. And then we have some uh, GPT-like models that we query with this like zero shot setup and we gather their answers. So we ask three times to each model to get some variability. Um, and we get like, um, uh, yeah, these three models. So CodeGen, which is from Salesforce, GPTJ, which is trained on natural language, uh, 6 billion, this was 12 billion, and then Encoder uh, from Facebook, uh, which uh, I think 6 mil billions as well. And, um, and we study uh, the three of them. So, uh, some insights about the data collection. So this uh, was uh, the setup. So we had uh, an eye tracker and we um, used the natural setting for them. So they could use the uh, VS code or uh, an idea that we're used to. In this case, uh, we set it up or everything with VS code and we use the plugin uh, to track uh, the scrolling and allow only discrete scrolling. So whenever some line was half uh, visible, half not, it was like doing a full scroll so that we always have exact mapping between the pixel on the screen and uh, the the letters behind, so the character behind. And we continuously log what is visible and what not so that we know exactly how to map uh, and uh, reconstruct the attention to each specific character. So in this work, we worked on character level because eye tracking just gave this uh, discrete uh, information. Um, there's uh, some more details about our eye tracking process. So. We convert eye fixation to character level visual attention. So these character level uh, attention maps. And uh, to do that, we take uh, like uh, a clear inspiration from our previous work where we use the total time that the char was under the eye of the developer as a proxy for the attention of the developer. So this is how a bunch of fixation events could look like to our like post-processing uh, technique. So one fixation was converted into a rectangle of uh, this size, 
like nine characters wide and three characters, three lines uh, vertically. And this is based on the size of the parafoveal region, which is what we can see with our eye with, uh, with a glance, let's say, because we can perceive also what is a little around of the character we are, we are pointing at. So that's why we use this. And this is dependent on the screen size and the distance. So we, we computed that according to uh, these parameters. And uh, once we have uh, many of those, we can compute these intermediate uh, uh, attention maps, which is more fine grade and character level. Um, but then if you give uh, pay more attention, you can see that some parts are like giving attention to blank spaces because those are also characters in our setup. So what we do, we clearly remove that. And uh, we just get the attention from the uh, part that are, uh, yeah, uh, actual tokens. Because we want to have data which is comparable to the model. And the model, they can only look at token of that random white space. Uh, they can only look at some white space, the one preceding, for example, uh, the line. So, for example, these were kept. Uh, of, of course, these two uh, images are on different codes, so you don't have to. No, it's actually the same code, but it's a bit shifted so this part which is very uh, blurred is then this part so it's a little shifted i trimmed in different ways um yeah so we, we come up with the attention map from for the human and on one side um then um uh, for the specific task we wanted to evaluate those but as you might imagine these questions are so open that unlike the the first task on code summarization where we had a precise answer uh, among the seven, for example, here we, we don't have. So we had to de define, a uh, let's say, a grading sheet or a gold, gold standard for uh, for grading each answer. And um, the four authors, uh, we define it together. And then we annotated 20% of them. We discussed to reach an agreement among two authors. And we, we got a substantial agreement uh, following this gold standard. And uh, then we continued so like separately to, to annotate the rest um, of the answers. We had an annotation scale, which was fairly simple. So either something is completely wrong, uh, something is completely correct, so matches all our expectations, or there are some points of the correct answer which are mentioned, so we give it a partially correct. So this is a, a quick summary of how we created it. And uh, uh, these are the results. So we see for developers encoder the neural uh, natural language based model and code gen. So we can see that developer uh, clearly uh, are uh, better and uh, thank thankfully let's say. So humans are still more effective, but on the on the flip side we also have that these models are not that bad. So sometimes they even get correct uh, or partially correct answers. So to questions that um, might seem quite quite challenging uh, at first sight. So they get around 35 more percent uh, correct or partially correct answers. So then we also inspect, since we have three different programming languages, Python, C Sharp, and C++, whether there are differences among programming languages. And here the data are not so, um, let's say, uniform about it. But uh, we have, for example, for some models like the GPTJ, which is trained on natural language, so probably all these languages are unfamiliar to it. Uh, it has a quite a big gap between uh, um, Python and C++. And this could be um, explained, for example, by the fact that this uh, model is trained on natural language and Python is very much closer to natural language or pseudocode or some reasoning form in natural language than, for example, C++ that has a lot of more syntax and stuff, which is very specific to code. So, uh, but beside that, we we didn't find many uh, other differences on this uh, programming language uh, side of the, the study. So as we can see from the result of the model, so code completion models, which is actually what we used, um, they are um, they are promising. There should be <laughs> not is not. They are promising, but not as a, a effective um, when answering this sense making question. So, for example, we we envision how a similar study could be done on like chatbot models, like for example, Llama, 
which is more uh, prone to this like open-ended question and giving an answer. So that could give much, much better result since this chatbot based model have been able to um, clear some uh, challenging uh, uh, exams sometimes, uh, some uh, law or some other disciplines at least. And then we have again, a study of the agreement. So with the same uh, methodology, we use the Spearman rank correlation coefficient for the three models, code gen, GPT, J, and encoder, and then here the human. And even here, the human, you, you can see it's still around the same uh, bulk, like around 0 0.5. So, and these were different data collection methods. So probably that's the best we could expect when talking about agreement with, between humans, also because of uh, uh, how humans reason on code differently, perhaps. Um, so what we see is that um, code gen has a um, weak but positive uh, correlation agreement, even on the regular attention. Whereas um, in terms of the um, uh, highest agreement, uh, we get that code gen and encoder, they get the highest agreement. And this again is uh, probably uh, related to the fact that they have seen more code than uh, GPTJ, which uh, was trained on natural language. So maybe the way in which we look code in natural language probably differs, and that could be one of the explanations. So understanding and agreement seem uh, somehow connected, and uh, but work more work is needed. Um, for like I said, with more performant uh, models. Uh, because these models were not that great. So they were promising in terms of performance, but they weren't on par of the human. So it would be nice to try with some models like Llama uh, and see what, how that positions in terms of also attention maps. Um, and uh, in the second and last part of the talk, I want to touch upon one uh, application of uh, uh, this uh, attention signal that we can uh, extract from the model. So we can uh, study it, compare it with uh, how human look at the code as we have done in the previous uh, three tasks. But going beyond that, we could try to use it for code exploration. So the, the intuition here is that we have a piece of code and we are pointing at this return statement. So if we have just read this statement, so one question that we could have is which part of the code should I look at next? So this is an unfamiliar code base. I've never seen it, or maybe it's a new file I'm not familiar with. So I want to know which are the main steps that a human goes through, uh, let's say, uh, the main parts of the code that are useful or relevant for the understanding task. So since the model shown like good understanding or promising understanding, we wanted to know whether that understanding can be used to guide the human. So this is the intuition. So to use the LLM to scan the code, for me or for the developer and then recommend the next line. So what to look at next. So the, um, to study this, we had to come up with this um, concept of a scan path or user interaction. Um, and we defined it as the likelihood that a user fixating at a specific position I, so for example here, then looks at the position J next or soon enough or soon, uh, in the code. So basically I try to extract the measurement of how deeply connected are these two code location. And in particular, how many times there is a flow from the location I to the location J. So, and to do that, we apply this uh, kind of uh, uh, setup where we use the sequence of fixation. So the humans goes through different parts in the code. And from those sequence of fixation, we want to derive a matrix, which looks like the following, where we have on one uh, side, each line defines the token where we start, so the I token, and uh, the column defines the token that is the target. So this matrix will have a size number of tokens times number of tokens. And uh, to compute the value inside those uh, cells of the matrix, we use this, uh, this formula. So we compute the strength of connection from token I to token J as, the, as this area. So what is this area? So this is the timeline. So this is the event EI when the user started looking at the token I here. 
And this is the event TI plus the duration of the fixation on I on the token, on the first token. So basically when you stop looking at the token. So whenever you stop looking at the token, there is a decay uh, that we uh, use. And then at certain point, you look at the next token, the token J, and then you stop looking at that token. So we wanted to uh, intuitively wait more a connection which is close in time, so the two events are closer, uh, and also longer um, time spent on the second uh, on the second token, for example, which would mean I just looked at this and then I go to these other tokens. So here in between, we could have some temporary token that I have to scan because my eye is naturally going towards the target. But then I will spend a significant portion of time towards the second uh, token. So this integral uh, will give me the total strength of connection from token I to token J. And this is just a mathematical way to express this. Um, so the integral, um, we compute it for each pair of events. So in our data set, the user might have gone from token I to token J multiple times. And what we do, we compute uh, um, this integral for all these pairs, sorted pairs, and then we sum them up to, to give the overall strength across the entire uh, code base. Is there any question on this part? Hi, Matteo. Um, yes. Yeah, I had a question. So how are you tracking which token the eye is looking at in this work? So we are using the eye tracker. So it's the same uh, data set as this. Oh, the same one. Oh. Yes, exactly. So it's the same oh. data set, but we just uh, try to use this for an application, uh, let's say. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, Thank you for that. Hey, thanks. OK. Is there any other question in particular on this uh, formula or this way of computing user interaction? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sure. So, so the strength will become like a, a probability or a scalar value? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a probability in the end. Um, if you consider a single line of this matrix, um, this will be then normalized to give us a probability from moving from token I to token J, for example. Uh, so yeah, the normalization is then done on uh, uh, each line. Uh, that's that's a good a good question. Yeah. Is there any other question? Okay. So I move towards. Um, how we uh, work, um, how we try to extract and process this attention signal to gather a similar information, but from the model. Uh, so we want the model to tell us this. So given that we are token I, how likely should we go to token J, for example? So to do that, I have to introduce some background on how the transformer works, and in particular, how the attention of transformer look like. So we have few uh, facts to look at. So first of all, these models, they are all GPT-based uh, model. So they are uh, they have masked attention. So they are not like BERT, which can see entirely the input, but they can just see the input um, progressively, uh, token by token. So whenever you do, uh, because they're trained in an autoregressive way. So whenever you try to encode a specific token, in this case, it, you can encode it by giving attention to only the preceding tokens. So not the future tokens that come like next. So this is one, one key concept. And uh, if you look at the attention map, uh, knowing this fact, it will look like the following. So the shape will be a lower triangular matrix where we have for each tokens, let's say these are different tokens, but let's imagine that uh, it is here and uh, we can only give attention to the tokens that uh, come previously and not the one that come after. So that's why it looks uh, triangular. And uh, so the first concept is that this tensor will look like uh, size number of tokens times number of tokens because each of these 
token is able to give some weight of attention to the previous one. Then the second fact is that a decoder, um, whenever you, you input a word uh, inside your model, it goes through different uh, layers or decoding blocks, one after the other. And this means that if our model like uh, uh, code gen, I think has 33 uh, or so layer, then our attention tensor will have different attens attentions for each layer. So our attention tensor will have an additional dimension, number of layers. Um, and then we also have that each layer has multiple attention head, which is just something to increase the uh, the likelihood or the performance um, to increase the performance of the model, which is shown to be effective. So basically, the same uh, tensor is extracted a number of times equal to the number of attention head. So we have an additional dimension, the this attention head. So what we uh, we do now, um, we introduce the other um, the concept of uh, uh, a post process a novel post processing method of this tensor to extract some information which tells us going from this token how likely we should go from this token to this other token, and all of this is derived from this attention tensor. So to compute this. Uh, attention um, metric or post-process attention that we call follow-up attention, we consider two key ideas. So we consider subsequent tokens as observer, because as we said before, um, the token it can observe, let's say, can give attention to all the one that precedes it. So this is one, uh, one key uh, idea that we use. So subsequent tokens are observer of the current token, let's say. And then we see how these uh, observers, so the tokens that come after the current one, how they change their attention through time. Um, and I, I will explain step by step what do I mean by true time. So let's take this example where we have some code on the left. And we would like to compute, thanks to the uh, model, how likely should we go from the token print to the token equal, for example. So our token print is a token i, and our token j uh, and our um, a token uh, equal is token j. So as we said, all the uh, tokens that come after our print, they are the observers of print, because they are the only one that can give attention to the print token, and in this case also to the equal token. So they can observe both. So we call them a follower or observers. And um, by definition, there are those that follow uh, both of them. And we consider them at time t. So at time t, we get how much weight of attention they give to the token print. So they might have different uh, weights. And then we check at the time t plus one, how they again change their attention. So the intuition is to understand whether most of them uh, went from token print to token J, uh, to, to token print to token uh, equal, for example. And okay. based on that, we want to quantify the strength of the connection from print to token equal. Uh, Matteo, uh, sorry yeah. to run the mini parade, but we have sort of 15 minutes left and then it's quite yeah. probable many people will leave, so please yeah, yeah. keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm almost at the end, so these are the last two okay. couple of slides. Yeah, thank you for the for the heads up. Okay, so is there uh, any question on this part? Um, otherwise, I will conclude. So now we have. Um, I, I had a, qu a uh, yes. question. Sorry. So, uh, Ma Matteo, actually, a couple of questions. Uh, is it possible to, uh, if uh, we could have a share of the, uh, a copy of the slides? And number two is if you have a publication for this particular work or regarding scan attention. That's mm -hmm. really in interesting. I really appreciate if you could share. This yeah, 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 yeah. I have the, the link at the, at the end, but I can, I can share them uh, later. Uh, so uh, yeah, I have, we have a paper, thank and I will mention it in the so very soon. Uh, okay, so thank, thank you. Thanks.
Thank you. Okay, so let, let me continue. So the idea is that we want to see how these observers change from looking at print and then looking at equal. And we want to see how much they uh, they agree with each other by shifting. So how many observers shifted from one to the other. And to do that, we use the cosine similarities between the two to check the overlap. So basically whether they change together. And uh, to account for the time, we use different layers of our neural network because the layers uh, process the input in a sequential way. So the output of layer uh, one goes to layer two and so on. So the attention that is constructed at layer two uh, is dependent on the attention of layer one. Um, so that's that's the, the intuition behind it. So we use the layer wise uh, propagation of the input as the concept of time, how the attention of the model changes across time. And we consider the token as the observer um, that will tell us how likely is that after looking token print, you want to see token equal. And after uh, computing this cosine similarity, we can get for each pair of uh, token i and token j, we can get a value and fill in a matrix. So the matrix will exactly look like the, the previous one for a human. So we have number of tokens times number of tokens. And, and this is the, the algorithm. So if you want more details, I can come back to this later. But let's now go to the evaluation of this. So we evaluate it in the next line prediction task. So instead of predicting the next token, which is a bit, uh, let's say, over specific, somehow for a real scenario, we might be uh, happy enough with the prediction of the next line. So we want the model or this uh, post processing of the attention to tell us which line to look at next. So to do that, we simply have to aggregate the column that refers to different uh, lines to to the same to different tokens belonging to the same line. So basically, we shrink a little bit the matrix horizontally, and we have the follow up attention coming from the model on the left, and the ground truth scan path computed from the from the um, humans, and then we compute the agreement on this specific task. For each token, we compare the distribution of the next line derived according to the model and the distribution to the next line derived according to our ground truth data. And we also apply the new metrics, which is maybe more practically uh, relevant, which is the top three overlap by line. So by line, because we compare everything by line, which is we see uh, the top three predictions of the model and the top three prediction of the human. So um, how many of those overlap? So there could be a three out of three overlap, or maybe just one or two or even zero. So Let's now look at the results. So we have um, on the left, the spin rank relation coefficient. On the right, we have uh, the uh, top three of a lab. And uh, we have, again, developer versus developers. And then we have follow-up attention. We have a series of other baseline, which I did introduce here, but you can have more details in the paper. So what we see here is that our follow-up attention, they're sorted based on uh, highest uh, agreement or overlap with the ground truth. So we have that uh, the follow-up attention uh, gets uh, ranked among the highest among the, the baselines, very close to the human. And here, interestingly, when we look at the top three overlap, the, the model has an even higher agreement than what uh, developer among themselves could do because developer among developers is lower. And the, the one that rank Above it are different way of post-processing attention. So there are also some baseline which do not depend on attention, but the one that are better than developer versus developer, they all use the attention. So there are some other heuristic that we tested here. So I invite you to, to read the paper for that. So here we have that uh, higher agreement. Um, so this high agreement between uh, uh, the ground truth and uh, uh, our way of post-processing follow. So the follow-up attention makes it promising for uh, like real, uh, uh, scenarios, for example, in an IDE. We did a short, uh, and then I conclude, uh, ablation study, where we try to check, uh, because here we use all the layers in our networks. The question is, what happens if we just use some pairs of layers? So our computation will be much faster, but how does the accuracy changes? So what we see here, we see that by using only the first two layers, so very little, but those very close to the input, we get most of the benefit 
and uh, we are most uh, most efficient as well because we don't have to compute this attention tensor for the entire network. Then uh, another uh, ablation study is about the number of observers because in theory we can generate as many new tokens as we want at the end of our current code that we are trying to analyze, and then uh, we could uh, use those as additional observers. But ideally, we we would like to have as the least amount of uh, new tokens to generate as possible so that we save computation. So even here, we see that we are quite robust to the number of tokens. Um, so if we decrease, the, our standard setup was 100. Uh, if we decrease the number of new tokens, we are still uh, fairly good, even with just 10 observers after the end of the, of the method, for example. So here we have a couple of parameters that are tunable and can lead to better efficiency uh, in real uh, real time and real life uh, uh, deployment, let's say. So I will just give some takeaway messages and then uh, conclude. So we have uh, some takeaways for the human studies. We've done three. So um, it's nice to pick a popular and challenging task to study like the three we picked. Uh, the data set uh, should be uh, popular and trusted. And of course, it depends on the task. The model um, suggests competitive uh, and that has like explainable AI embedded, such as attention. For recruiting participants, uh, we have this uh, filtering mechanism I mentioned in the, in the first part of the talk, which um, could be useful if you want to rely on Amazon Mechanical Turk, but you can also use direct contacts, obviously. And uh, for the data collection, we also published our uh, human reasoning recorder, which is available uh, uh, as an artifact of the publication at the ASC 2021. You could reuse it. Or uh, also, uh, yeah, you you can also access the second artifact for this plugin VS Code for allowing for eye tracking study. For modern understanding, uh, so with attention, we could reveal some blind spots of the AI models, some tokens that have been overlooked, for example, and um, we also benchmark that uh, human uh, models are not that effective like uh, the model that we studied. Although ChatGPT could uh, could improve uh, fairly fairly quickly, or chat-based model are promising uh, next uh, step. So we had initial evidence that better agreement leads to better model. So it would be nice to see actually like proved proven like some like model trained on the, this data uh, trained to mimic the the human. Is it actually better? And then um, we so that uh, code understanding and code exploration could be a good first application of attention signal. So as the next step, I would I, I see uh, the moment could be like creating an attention-based benchmark suite for this model for debugging purposes to, to test these models at scale before deployment to see whether they look at the right part of the code. Then another uh, direction, which is the one explored with our last application, uh, which is going beyond um, pure explanation, but try to solve a new task like code exploration. And then uh, it's definitely interesting to have more user study for, specifically for the application of like code exploration to see whether they could benefit or how they could benefit from this attention information. If Even if it's not code exploration, but another task, how they want to look at it. So just to conclude, acknowledge uh, the collaborators for this work. Yeah, Michael Pryor, my advisor, Dominique uh, Huber, uh, thesis, uh, master's thesis student, and then uh, three people uh, worked with uh, uh, Albert uh, Ziegler from GitHub Next during my internship, uh, the last uh, work I mentioned, sense making, uh, Rahul Pandita from GitHub Next, and then Austin Henley from Microsoft Research, uh, still in the same, the same work. So let's uh, let's connect, uh, maybe for collaboration or just to uh, stay in touch. Uh, you can reach me through email or through LinkedIn. And thanks again for the invitation. I believe we are still have five minutes for questions. And uh, these are the three papers that are waiting for you with more insights. And you can find them on um, my scholar page, or I can share also the links if you want. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Matteo. So indeed, we have five minutes for a short, very short discussion, and then maybe if you want to stay a little bit more, and if some other, somebody else wants to stay a little bit more, we can try to continue. If we will one way kick out. So, folks, any questions? All right, then I'll probably just start. So. 
One of the options that came uh, up to my mind for what could we use with the attention is possibility to do something with the code review or for writing documentation. So, okay, for code review, we have a large code review person gets, and probably you would like to focus on the parts of the code review which are non of the of the pull request which are non trivial. But I, I guess we can't use the model as it is right now directly. And for writing documentation, kind of the same, like the, the hardest pieces of code to understand uh, should be probably the ones for which we need some kind of comments. Do you think there is any simple or semi-simple way to adopt your studies and your model for these tasks? These are two very interesting, uh, uh, interesting tasks. Um, so let me uh, think. Uh, so we experimented with CodeGen and they are open source models, so they could be directly reused for code review and code documentation. So that the goal in code documentation is to find uh, the right part of documentation based on a query. So something like code search, uh, not, not like documentation search, kind of like a search engine. Is that the goal? Mm. Yeah, the kind. I mean, right now the model looks uh, uh, as a code to figure out like what to write next or, or some or how to explore, but then could maybe we could look at the hardest pieces of code because they're not necessarily hardest from the, I don't know, schematic complexity point of view, or maybe they're most important ones if we try to match the commit content versus what is written in the in the pull request as a code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for code review, I can see a direct uh, reuse of this uh, code exploration because um, this follow-up attention could help whenever you're exploring certain part of the code base to give a uh, direction of which in which order you should look at the different files. For example, uh, if you have a, a few files, you might even aggregate and not reason on the line level, but even maybe looking at the file level could be interesting enough. Um, so you just open the file in the right order. So you get the context right, let's say. Um, so there could be another granularity which could be used also for code review. Uh, but within the same file, we can reuse the same context. Uh, so we could the same the same uh, yeah tooling like uh, follow up attention. Yeah, and for documentation, I don't have any uh, straightforward uh, reuse on top of my mind. Um, yeah, does it answer partially? Uh, I guess so. Yeah. So, all right, uh, once again, thank you for your time and we are about out of time. So let's, for those who have any questions, I guess we can stay a little bit more. And once again, thank you very nice for a very nice talk. And yep. thank you. Thanks a lot for thank the Thank you, Mateo. Yeah, feel free to join our like seminars in the future if you like inter yeah, interested. Yeah, so all. yeah. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, see you in in October, I guess. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. Uh, in October, we'll have a talk on which metrics should we use uh, to assess code generation quality, like yet, an, yeah. uh, yet another installation of some metrics which should could be, should be helpful. All right. So let me ask just one last time: Does anybody have any questions? I have, but it's a bit high level. <laughs> Just to know your thoughts on some question. So my question is, um, like, it is this all about attention or more about, um, like, r r really attention pay uh, much more to these results than what is going inside the human brain or inside the model, because maybe you know some studies when they try when people try to um, like change uh, and uh, substitute human att human attention with uh, not human or vice versa it's simpler like to substitute models attention to human matrix how they uh, appreciate or read code mm -hmm. so so you mean to to use like uh, models uh, to to rank the uh, readability of code, something like that. Is uh, that like uh, just to measure, uh, for example, 
uh, people trying to come up with models uh, of, of with the method's name. Mm -hmm. uh, we collect his, uh, his or her attention and push it into the models and uh, and substitute uh, models attention with this attention function and mm -hmm. try to evaluate the results are better, worse, change somehow, or like, uh, mm -hmm. like, something like this. Um, I'm writing it down. So the idea is to inject human attention uh, huh. into the model in real time. So whenever you're doing prediction, you just want to bias the model with your attention. So you look at the code and, uh, and then you give that attention to the model and then you expect the prediction. That's a very interesting one. So it could be, I think it could be really interesting uh, because it, it, it could, I can already see it using an IDE. So maybe you spend your entire afternoon looking uh, at some code base and you collect a lot of data on the, which part is relevant for you today because you're working on a specific task. So you have seen maybe uh, files uh, many times, some other files very little, and then you inject this information into the model as form of like attention, right? So you give all the code and this attention from the humans, and then you see how it works. So it's a really uh, nice idea. And it's also, um, yeah, pointing. So I'm aware of other studies that I uh, mentioned briefly on natural language. So they, they collected uh, data of uh, human looking at text, or they even had models of how human looked at text. They generated the data set of this attention and then they bias the model towards learning during a training, proper training. Mm -hmm. uh, they bias the model towards learning um, that kind of uh, attention patterns. And that enhanced the performance of the model. So I can imagine that if you give uh, this uh, attention in real time to the model, you could, in principle, improve the performance because they will be predicting the part of code that is most likely connected to the one that you have seen before in the past, right? Um, I, I'm just thinking about an evaluation way, a way to evaluate that. I think it's it's a bit more challenging, right? Because, uh, yeah, but it's, yeah, it's a great idea. And also, also one possible continuation of your work can be maybe to do something. If you, you, you now you have Copilot, uh, like AI system assistant, and you can uh based on what people look at you can uh, uh put some pieces of code into the prompt if if their user accepts this mm -hmm. but uh the precision of like ongoing camera tracking and eye tracking is not really well but maybe if you substitute it with the mouse clicks or like another mm -hmm. actions of human yeah. it also can help but interesting like for me personally, uh, as, as sometimes I want that not to copy paste some code into a system uh, or just look at it and it appears, <laughs> you know. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I assume that uh, what is developer looking at, it's really help and really relevant what he is asking about. So it's like good context. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what I also know from, I mean, it's available publicly yeah. that uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, Copilot is also using the open tabs um, as like an information. So there is a whole like lot of work on this prompt engineering task, what to put in the context because that's mostly limited the context of this model or you want to keep it limited for performance reason. So I think it's uh, it's it's very interesting to um, so I think there is there is also space for exploring how to reuse um, attention on different uh, uh, tasks across tasks. So for example, you you have a code base. You could have the model to look at this code base once and just store the attention that was given to this code base, and then instead of um, and then reuse this attention as a as a way to select which part of the input, which which part of the context should, should be used for each real time prediction. Um, so basically, use the attention signal to inform the prompt engineering part of the task. So yeah, these are all like intricate and connected topics. 
so yeah, with prompt engineering, it's definitely the term, I think. Yeah. One more stupid idea for follow-up is as follows. Obviously, different attention of different developers have different value. And one thing it could be interesting to study is to ask developers who work a lot on certain repository to say, review a pull request or do stuff like that, and then figure out what kind of things they focus on. And then these things may or may not be useful as to things to which the model should pay attention to. On the one hand, the per this person already has a very good knowledge of where to look and where not to look, because I don't know, whenever I'm looking at a completely new piece of code, my eyes are all over the place and trying to figure out what's going on. On the other hand, they may be they might be too smart to compare with a non normal developer or a model. What are you saying? So, so you're saying, uh, so I followed you until you said, um, you ask the human to look at the pull request and you get the attention. And then yeah, what and, yeah. do you do? And these humans are experts in, in, in the yeah. in, in this repository. Yes, yes, yes. So you, so you want to see whether there is a difference between the expert looking at the pull request versus the non-experts? Okay, yeah, and whether maybe we can utilize experts or maybe we should not. Whether we can use expert, you mean? Yeah, you know, like use expert as a reference for this attention data set, or maybe we should not use expert. Is that is that could be interesting? I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, it makes makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that could become also like, yeah, if the if the data if the the code base is very standard and used by many people and relatively stable, maybe there could be a general knowledge of what is more important. And that can be built up through time uh, as many developers look at it, what caught their attention mostly. So there could be also stats about that in the repository itself, maybe, that are ever evolving, let's say, that give you a heat map over the input because people looked here and then there. So kind of data-driven. So it's, this is not using the attention, but it's more using the human data. But yeah, it's interesting, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, ben, you have a question? Yes, I have a question regarding you are using the attract data. Like you, according to my understanding, you only consider the um, regression, like the backwards scan, uh, how do you say, jump of fixation, maybe. Uh, I wonder, have you only considered like the UD direction from uh, the current to the back one, like if I give you an example, if you have ABC from top to the bottom, three fixations, uh, three tokens, and go to B, then I go to A, then I'm from A and jump to C. So yeah, A to C is the forward, but still is a previous token of the current token C. So for this kind of jump, like, would you take them into account when you um calculating their probability? So you mean whether our probability is only like backwards? So it's only recommending things that come before the current token. That's what you you say. Yeah. 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 That's that's a good question. And in the example in the slide, it was only backward, but it can be also in the opposite direction. And the only thing you have to change is the the layers. Um, so you you consider them in the in the opposite direction because we know that the input is processed sequentially layer by layer. So for example, uh, in the uh, first layer we have the starting token, and in the second layer we have the target token, but they don't have to be um, in the specific order that the target token comes before in the text. It can also come later in the text. Do you want me to open the slides? Maybe it's it's easy. Uh, it's fine. I can look at your publication later. Uh, I have one more question it's regarding your intervention mechanism. Like uh, after you have gained all this like attention uh, distribution, how would you introduce to the user interface to uh, help the uh, developers to you take advantage of them or make use of this information? Yeah, yeah, that's that's also a, an interesting direction which is still open. 
and I mentioned in the last uh, slides, uh, yeah, how to, I mean, how to conduct user study that use this information. So how I see it at the moment could be like a series of uh, a prediction, uh, predicted next lines that can be shown uh, in uh, next to the current cursor. So you might see like uh, uh, line uh, top one, next line, top two, top three, for example, or uh, or even like some follow, some go through the go to definition kind of functionality, so that you can always click on a certain line and it will go to the next line according to the neural model. So you you don't go to like the you you, you understand what what I mean? So basically, uh, keep the top next line. Um, Oh, I, I thought you have already done a sort of design of this and done the user study for this. That's why I was wondering, like, how does it look looked like? No, no, no. no. We, we gather the data on the task, which was the sense-making task. So the, the developer just reasoned on code freely. So we have a data set of developer looking at code and try to answer certain questions, these sense-making questions. And then from that, we gather the information about them, but we didn't do an intervention to reuse that. So we use those historical data as a way to see whether those historical data of human, they align with uh, the data that we compute from the neural models, this follow-up attention. So we could say that uh, now this follow-up attention recommends something which is in agreement to what a general human uh, wants to look at next, okay? Now the question is whether that can be actually useful for the human to improve the performance on some task. That's a different question, and that should be addressed with an intervention. As you said, yeah. Thanks for the. Student. Thank so, you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, Marshall. Mattel, and do you still working on uh, this area or you moved somewhere else or? Yeah, I'm, I'm still interested in, in this. Um, so I'm uh, at the, on two different, I'm exploring two different areas which are a bit far apart, but they, they have some contact points. So for example, um, this uh, work that I presented is one and the other one is related to applying uh, um, uh, program analysis techniques or uh, software engineering in general to quantum computing. Um, so I think the, the two things, so software testing for quantum computing code. So it's uh, it's in another direction. But one study that we did recently and it's an archive was about um, uh, testing this um, because quantum computing are a fairly uh, recent code basis. So they have the equivalent of the compiler, like GCC. They have something similar themselves. So we wanted, we are focusing on testing those kind of the equivalent of the compiler for the quantum world. And we worked on like fuzzing techniques for, for that. Um, and uh, we recently worked on a technique based on the um, LLMs to generate, to fuzz um, this, uh, platforms and we apply it also to like GCC or like more traditional target uh, platforms to, to test. And uh, the so that's the kind of an intersection between large language models and the interest for quantum. So we also tested this quantum with this approach. And uh, one of the, it's called fast for all. You can find it as, as well on my, on my page. And that is uh, um, the nice innovation there was that we could give some parts of the documentation. So these, these, um, compiler, let's say, from quantum is evolving quite fast. Uh, so there are new parts of documentation coming up uh, soon with new features and so on. So we gave these new features to the LLMs and the LLM could generate programs which were unseen before with this new feature. So it was uh, really interesting and we could find some bugs in those new features. So it's basically a target fuzzing. And that's that's a way we are trying to intersect. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that there is a space for more work in this direction of the uh, Re going beyond the explanation, but actually trying to find something uh, useful, try to, to do something useful with the attention signal. Because at the moment, we just throw it uh, and uh, we, don't, we don't use it. Most of the things that are done nowadays with these models. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, folks? 
Okay, Sam.